Please welcome ASM President Stephen Finkel. Thank you, thank you. I am so excited to be here today in person with you and welcome you to ASM Microbe 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we've been successful in meeting virtually over the last two years, I feel very grateful to be together with you today. Uh, we persevered through tough times, made the responsible decisions to move our meetings online. But now, as I look at all of you, not on a video screen, I am just so excited to be making direct personal contact again in a scientific setting. Uh, thank you to the ASM Microbe Program Committee for all their hard work to get us here today. A special thank you to the co-chairs of the ASM Microbe Program Committee, Kumaran Ramamurthy and Yvette McCarter. We greatly appreciate your leadership. You and your committee have assembled an amazing scientific program which will energize all of us. Let's thank them, please. I would also like to particularly welcome our students, trainees, and young investigators who are joining us today and for the week. You are the future of the microbial sciences, and I hope that you will find this meeting inspiring and an opportunity to further engage in the field. ASM is your home. I truly believe that, and we are so proud to have you here. We're here to help you advance in your careers, and we want you to succeed. Ask questions, make your needs known to us. I encourage you to participate fully in the meeting. To the meetings department at ASM and the staff that have worked tirelessly to get us here, thank you, thank you, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I know personally that I'm not taking for granted how wonderful I'm feeling at this moment and know that there's been a tremendous amount of work to get us to where we are right now. And I know that the thousands of folks will be attending the conference this week also feel the same way. We would not be here without their efforts. On behalf of the ASM, I also wanna thank you our scientific community for all your unwavering dedication during the pandemic. In particular, I'd like to make a shout out to our clinical microbiologists, clinicians, drug developers, basic scientists who went through wave after wave of COVID as the virus continued to mutate and spin off new variants. But these folks who help diagnose, prevent, cure disease and keep us all safe. Your contributions are obviously incredibly important to us. To our industry partners, we truly appreciate your ongoing support and patience throughout the planning cycle as ASM transitioned back to in-person meetings. Exhibitors are an integral part of ASM Microbe and we're excited to once again experience the buzz of a live exhibit hall. Special thanks to our tiered supporters, Bio Merieu at the gold level and Carius at the silver level for your generous contributions. They are greatly, greatly appreciated. And now I am particularly honored to share a message with you from ASM's ambassador to Ukraine, Dmitro Stepansky. Our Ukrainian members have been working tirelessly under extremely difficult conditions in Ukraine. We are so proud of them and hope we can continue to support them in any way possible. Greetings from Ukraine. Uh, hello, I am Dmitro Stepansky and I'm American Society of Microbiology ambassador to Ukraine. I'm so excited to be joining you all for ISM Microbe 2022 virtually and look forward to connecting with you all online. On behalf of ISM members in Ukraine, I want to thank you all so much for your support during such difficult times for the Ukrainian people. Science is a global endeavor that depends on international collaboration and discourse. And that's why I'm so excited to invite you to a remote rapid fire session taking place on the digital platform on Saturday, June 11, from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Please plan to join me and my fellow colleagues from Ukraine as we present our research in the online community corner on the digital platform. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. So thank you for that message, Dimitro. Um, I would like to ask all of our attendees here in the conference hall and those connected from home to take a moment to acknowledge our fellow microbiologists in the Ukraine.
As a leader of the microbial sciences, the American Society for Microbiology is at the vanguard for improving public health, influencing science policy, publishing innovative science, convening prominent thought leaders, and helping our members succeed. ASM is uniquely positioned to bring together key stakeholders and experts from around the globe, from basic science researchers to clinical microbiologists to advocacy leaders, harnessing the power of microbes to solve the world's most pressing challenges. And no matter what your field of endeavor is, ASM strives to make microbial sciences into the most diverse field in STEM so that we can continue to make the biggest impacts that we can. You know, diversity is strength, and that is really what ASM is all about. You can also help us continue our crucial work by donating to ASM. You thought you were going to get out of this for free? You can easily do this by visiting asm.org donate and choose a program you might like to support. You can also visit the ASM booth and make your donation there. Um, your support would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Finally, I have one important duty to carry out today. Um, this is the first in-person meeting of ASM Microbe since 2019, as you all know. As a result, we have had two presidents who did not enjoy the privilege and pleasure of meeting you all in person. Therefore, I would like to call up to the stage our current past president, Dr. Victor Dorita, and our past past president, that's a title I just invented, Dr. Robin Patel. Both of these leaders have guided the ASM as well, uh, sorry, both, both these leaders guided this organization through some of the most difficult and challenging times the ASM as well as society at large has ever experienced. And they did it with grace and consideration and a lot of talent. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And I'm just so happy to present to you Presidents Patel and President Dorita. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society for Microbiology, Dr. Stefano Bertuzzi. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Welcome to the 2022 ASM Micro Meeting. I really also want to say welcome back. Uh, welcome back in person. It feels so different and so wonderful to be here. And uh, I also allow me to extend a big thank you to the chairs of the Micro Meeting, Kumaran and Yvette. They did a fantastic job with their committee. And what you're in here is for a wonderful week of great science, learning from each other, of hearing about the latest science advances, really, really exciting things that the program committee has prepared. Thanks to all the speakers that join us and the poster presentation and the young investigators and everything here. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so, really go beyond what you'll learn in the science here, that's will be the meat of our meeting, but I'd like to spend a few words and say, why? Why is it that what we learn here as microbiologists, what we learn in our labs, in our institution day in, day out, why it is so important? And why is it important and it matters well beyond the thousands of people that are here at Micro, the tens of thousands of scientists and hundreds of thousands of scientists around the world, but why it matters for society? And why so much is at stake in the world right now? And why we need to engage and really bring our science more than ever to fruition for the benefit of all humanity. And I think we just heard from our wonderful ambassador in, uh, in Ukraine, and I hope that you do join the, the session that they put up virtually. They're literally working under the bombs and uh, they wanted to be here, and we found a way of delivering their science and their contribution. And this brings me to the unexpected fact, the two presidents that were just recognized that did a terrific job during the pandemic. Little we know, Robin and Vic, that would have moved from the pandemic to the pandemonium. And, uh, and the war 
in Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine, I think goes well beyond those two countries. It's truly the result of going all the way back to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And what I think we did not understand is that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we mistook the end of the war, the Cold War, with the end of the peace. Because in essence, there has been an unresolved world, I would say disorder, that has been frozen for a while. And all the globalization and all that happened actually did not quite deliver a new order, a new benefit for all humanity coming together without ideology. And what we're surfacing today is actually very worrisome trends, like seeing autocracies on the rise all around the world in many continents. Actually, probably there are more people living under autocratic regime than under democratic regimes. And what has actually been quite striking is how this nationalistic approaches have been cropping up all over the world. As microbiologists, we have seen, and the pain that has given us to see at times how the pandemic was handled. We should have, the whole world, we should have all united against a common enemy, a virus. And yet, there were a lot of divisions, a lot of nationalistic approach. And I'm here the image of the vaccines. We had a house on fire, and yet, we pretended to put out that fire in one room or one room at the time independently. There was no coordination of a global vaccination program of global activities. This is significantly worrisome and it would be worrisome enough. But I would layer on top of this, another element that I think is a cipher of our times right now. And it is the Tower of Babel that we live in in 2022, which has its root in our digital communication. I think that social media in particular, in particular could have a phenomenal power to, for democratization, for actually giving voice to those who do not have a voice, for surfacing things that could not be seen. And they have done that in part. However, that lens has shattered. And it seems that through social media, people are yelling at each other from little segment, segments of this shattered lens. Everybody knows everything. Everybody understands anything, anything, everything. Everybody's the repository of the truth, yelling that truth to the person on the other piece of the lens. And a recent article, I think that I read, captured this perfectly in The Atlantic. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. Why the past 10 years, of American life have been uniquely stupid. I think the title captures it. So under this climate, we are seeing how the supply of disinformation is becoming trending toward infinite. And so why should we be surprised in this environment that attacks on science and attacks on scientists are becoming so common. Recent data from organizations like Science Counts or the Pew Research Trust have shown a significant decline in the confidence of science among the general population of significant magnitude. And that is, I think, rooted in these events, in these uh, trends that we're seeing. So certainly, we don't want to stay here to describe the world. As scientists, we want to change the world. We want to do better. And so I've been thinking, what do we need in this environment? And three things came to mind. The first thing that we need is really important. It's probably the core of everything. We need social capital. We need networks. We need networks of people, real people networks that have high level of trust that allow us to interact and believe in each other and support each other. Think about why you're here today. Think about the network that we can be and the power that can come out of this. 
The second thing that we need are strong institutions. And I thought carefully in picking this image, and I thought that the image of the Lincoln Memorial, the beautiful Lincoln Memorial in Washington, by the way, welcome to Washington, D.C., my city. And uh, if you have, actually not where I was born, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but the, the real thing of Washington is, uh, if you have time, go see the Lincoln Memorial. It's beautiful. But two things come to mind. The first one is that the country at that time was as divided as ever and made it. And at that time made it with President Abraham Lincoln doing the right thing in history, not just for that moment, but forever. That is the kind of institution, that is the kind of value that we need. And what we need connected with our social capital, with our institution is us, is the possibility of share our story of engaging with each other, of leaning on each other. That is gonna give us the strength to actually move forward and change this world. So you'll be wondering, why the hell is he telling me all this? And I actually think that it would be disingenuous to think that us scientists are immune from what is happening all over the world. I can tell you that the geopolitical climate the communication climate is influencing science today and will influence science tomorrow more than ever. Because science is an intrinsic part of society. It's not an ivory tower separated from it. And on top, science generates incredible dividend for that society. And if science is not part of that society, if society does not support science, then we're in trouble. And since I mentioned Lincoln before, I'll mention him again. President Lincoln once said, nothing is possible without the public sentiment, but everything is possible when the public sentiment is there. So how can we be successful scientists if we don't have the sentiment of the people? And what we have to do as scientists is not trivial. Our microbial sciences are more important and more relevant than ever for the world, for diseases, for health, for the environment. The microbiome has opened our eyes to unexpected and totally unpredictable effects. Not only the microbiome and the microbiota as a whole, but now we are actually exploring the single, single organism, single microorganism are actually completely blurring the field of microbiology and becoming relevant, for example, for cancer immune therapy in lung uh, treatment, lung cancer treatment. And how, what is a microbiologist today? These are the kind of successes, these are the kind of tools that we provide to the world. And it's not just about health. It's also about our environment. It's also about our agriculture. And here I'd like to quote, the recent book from ASM past president, Joe Handelsman, A World Without Soil. Joe beautifully explained how this thin crust around the earth is supporting everything that we do and without microbes, nothing would be possible. Life would not be possible. And this is in danger. This is a real problem. And so these are the kind of thing, this is why us as scientists today, what we learn is not just about our knowledge, which is fantastic to learn and gives us a lot of pleasure, but it has real relevance for what is happening out there. But I wanna go back to the two problems that I mentioned at the beginning, the geopolitical climate and the communication. We're not immune from what is happening. We're not shielded from this. And what concerns me is that the core values, the core principle of science and of ASM are at risk under this environment. And I'll list a few of them that I think are the very top of mind of all of us. Collaboration and cooperation, ASM's global health program that helps deliver diagnostics and uh, training throughout the developing world for infectious diseases. It's just a phenomenal thing. How are we supporting this? How are we growing this 
in an environment with those challenges that I just mentioned. ASM commitment to open science, open data, and open access is a very important value that we want to cherish and we want to develop. Recently, ASM has joined an initiative of the National Academy, all three of the academies, science, engineering, and medicine, and a roundtable on aligning incentives for open science. How do we all band together to really make sure that science is open, reaping all the benefit, that everybody can reap the benefits of science. I would also mention under the rubric of open science, a very important initiative and attend the events that they're organizing of the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. ASM has been instrumental actually to start this initiative, which is a complete separate now group, which is funded by the Department of Energy, the Biological and Environmental Research Program. And here I'd like to give a, a shout out to Dr. Charlene Weatherwax, who has been an instrumental force for this research and she's retiring soon. And so thank you, Charlene, for uh, uh, all that you've done for the microbial sciences. I mentioned the NMDC because the terrific leadership of Emily Fardosh and Nigel Mouncey at JGI have really identified the problem of having an infrastructure, a data infrastructure that is conducive to accelerate microbiome research because simple genomic databases are not enough because guess what? Metadata in microbiome is as important as data. It's not a footnote. And so ASM has been instrumental with its advocacy, with its ideas and its activities from the get-go to be the platform, to hold the space for this to happen and then seeing this thriving by others who bring it forward is just fantastic. And on the open access front, ASM is very committed to open access and as in the long run, we transition to everything in open access. It's very challenging, but we wanna do it. And I just mentioned our newest open access journal, Microbiology Spectrum, which has been terrifically successful. So thank you to Christina Cuomo, the editor-in-chief, Pat Schloss, the chair of our uh, journals committee and all the staff that works on this. I also would like to mention the value of our environment and conserving the environment and the role that microbes can play on this. And here, the Academy of Microbiology is focusing the next five years on making sure that the role of microbes, which can be friends and foe in uh, climate change, actually are part of the discourse and can be leveraged to be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. The value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. ASM has formed this great committee, the IDEA Committee, under the leadership of Gretchen D. It's a board member of ASM which has done already terrific work. We have transformed the nomination and the appointment system of ASM to make it as inclusive as possible and way more to be done. We have the Future Leaders uh, Program. 130 students are, and, and young scientists are here today from um, di diverse backgrounds and are not received grants to come to the meeting, but they're not just here on microbial tourism check but they actually here with mentors. And I'd like to thank those 140 plus mentors that are actually working with them to really help make the most out of this meeting. We need a diverse workforce and we're really committed as ASM to making microbiology the most welcoming and one of the most diverse fields in all science. It's a big challenge. We're very committed to this. We are committed to ASM being a trusted source the word trust is more important than ever in this environment. And our phenomenal advocacy program with great leader leadership from Dr. Uh, um, Stacy Schultz Cherry and uh, Alan Siegel, it's been incredible what has been accomplishing during the pandemic and well beyond that. You're in good hands. We are here trying to make sure that science goes forward in Washington. And let me transition now to say, how this book, just very recent that I read, The Earned Life by Marshall Goldsmith, really made me think. The way Marshall Goldsmith defined earned life is that we're living on earned life when choices, risks, and effort we make in each moment align with an overarching purpose in our lives. 
Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful to live by that? Let me tweak this a little bit. I think it's also works very well if you think about the association of getting together about ASM. We can talk about the learned society, but we can also talk about the earned society. And we really wanna to belong to a society of scientists where the choices, the risk, and the effort we make in each moment align with the purpose of benefiting humanity. And that's why I really wanted to tell you today how important it is what you're embarking in this journey of great science while you're here. So if we have all these problems in the world, in the communication, I am convinced and I'm truly convinced that the power of the association, the power of a scientific society like ASM is in part the solution to these problems. Alexis de Tocqueville in 1835, when he wrote Democracy in America, perfectly understood that. He saw and identified the strength of the American democracy in the citizens getting together and rallying for one cause that they thought was important. And so in the era of the Tower of Babel, my question to you is, how do we make the principles of Tocqueville of 1835 new again in going forward? How do we use the power of association like ASM to really be the solution to the disintegration, to the yelling at each other, to the autocracies, to the fragmentation of everything? Association are bringing people together and we're doing it today and we do it every day of the year. I don't have the answer to this question, but as I said, I am really committed to exploring this with you because as everything is fragmented, associating and the power of association is the solution to this problem. And ASM is embarking on a very ambitious project called ASM Microbe 2040, which wants to give answers collectively to these questions. This is a visioning exercise that the board of director has started and will involve the whole society. And we're already working in this direction. As I mentioned, the academy is already exploring microbes and climate change. I also would like to announce today that ASM is working toward a renewed focus on drug development in the era of antibiotics development. And uh, I would like to thank a great leadership for top leaders in this area, Dr. Robert Bonanno, Dr. Karen Bush, and Dr. Jennifer Leeds, who are leading a new task force on drug development science. And there will be a December meeting engaging this and making sure that in this great problems, great menace that we are confronted, the data are absolutely scary. If we thought that the pandemic was bad, Think about the threats of any microbial resistance, which are actually gonna be generating, according to estimates in the, from The Lancet earlier this year, more deaths than HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. Also, on the agricultural front, there's some important advocacy coming up. The farm bill is gonna be reauthorized soon, and there is a big role that microbes need to play in here, and we wanna engage in this. These are the kind of things that we need to really think in our Microbe 2040 project. How do we make, how do we give the answers to what is needed to the world and what needs to be done? I'm giving you just a few examples, but most importantly, we need to engage. We need to engage you. We really want to hear from you. And you have here uh, an inbox where we like to, where you can write to us because we'll come out on the Micro 2040 project more and more, you'll hear a lot more in the future, but it's really important that we put the power of our association of getting together to really help us in this very challenging scenario of the world that we are right now. We are convinced that science, that the microbial sciences can be and will be a very important tool in our toolbox to help make the world a better place. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for all your science and learn a lot, share a lot. We need you and engage with ASM. Thank you.
Please congratulate the American Academy of Microbiology 2022 awardees. Please congratulate the American Academy of Microbiology 2022 Fellows.
Please welcome Virginia Miller. Hello and welcome uh, to Microbe 2022. It's my distinct pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to honor Dr. John Mechalanis with the ASM Lifetime Achievement Award for Sustained Contributions to Microbial Sciences. So John Mechalanis certainly has had a very extraordinary career. For over 40 years, he has been one of the most influential leaders in the microbial sciences. Beyond his trailblazing research in bacterial pathogenesis, his impact extends to mentoring and developing generations of microbiologists, as well as shaping one of the world's premier microbiology departments. He is well known for fostering an environment of open communication that encourages discovery and creativity. So John did his PhD at UCLA with co-advisors John Collier and William Romig. And it was during this time that he began his enduring love affair with Vibrio cholera. He then did a postdoctoral training with John Murphy at Harvard Medical School and joined the faculty there in 1981 and later served as chair for 20 years. His research focuses on bacterial pathogenesis using genetics, genomics, and transcriptomics to explore pathogen host interactions, virulence gene regulation, and how pandemics emerge. Discoveries from his group have spanned the fundamentals of basic biology of bacteria, host pathogen interactions, as well as translational science directed at understanding how to better control diarrhea and cholera. In addition, Mechalanos and his colleagues have developed novel genetic tools for manipulate and study bacterial species. Over the course of his career, he has received many honors and awards, including the ASM Eli Lilly Award, the AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize for Outstanding Paper Published in Science, Election to the National Academy of Sciences, and the Sanofi Institute Pasteur Award for Biomedical Research. And so now please, uh, we'd like to play a video and then welcome Dr. Mechalanis to the stage. delighted to tell you today about the work that we recently published in Cell that has to do with the interactions of bacteria with each other in the context of a very interesting nanomachine called the type 6 secretion system. The nanomachine itself is extremely dynamic, undergoes very dramatic changes uh, in its structure that can be visualized with fluorescent microscopy. And those changes uh, correspond to events that result in protein translocation. We've uh, been observing this machine in several different bacterial organisms, the organism that causes cholera, called Vibrio cholera, and the organism Pseudomonas aeruginosa, an opportunistic pathogenesis of fibrosis patients. In the case of Vibrio cholera, the machine seems to cycle from one location in the cell to another location in the cell, and that corresponds to the ability of Vibrio cholera to kill many other bacterial species. In the case of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the machine seems to remain in one place, and that place is more often than not exactly corresponding to the activity of the machine in an adjacent cell. We call this dual activity, this cell-cell interaction of the two machines, dueling to uh, emphasize that one cell seemed to attack another cell, and that was fo followed by a quick counterattack of the cell that was attacked. Now, this was happening between sister cells, cells that are genetically identical, and obviously, uh, Sister cells are not out to kill each other, and it turns out that there are immunity proteins in the system that prevents those attacks from being lethal uh, for sister cells. But having observed that, we came to the conclusion that this activity likely uh, had a basis for interactions of heterologous bacteria, species other than Pseudomonas, and that was the focus of this paper. So what we uh, went ahead and did was we took Vibrio cholera and labeled it with fluorescent dyes that allowed it to be red, and then put that together with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, labeling those cells green. And as you can see in our videos, when you mix these cells together, a very dramatic thing occurs. The red cells, the Vibrio cholera cells, begin to round up. They go from their classic Vibrio comma shape 
elongated rod-like cells to these round spherical cells. Those cells represent uh, cells that are in the process of actually lysing, breaking apart, and dying. And you can measure that quantitatively and show that indeed Pseudomonas aeruginosa kills vibrio cholera, and the killing event depends on type 6. But the remarkable additional observation we made was that if we inactivated the type 6 machine in vibrio cholera and did the same experiment again, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa had no interest in killing the vibrio cholera, and they coexisted. In other words, the attack of the type 6 positive vibrio cholera cell was inducing a lethal counterattack from the Pseudomonas that resulted in that cell's death. This is why we call it tit for tat. If the vibrio attacks first, the Pseudomonas counterattacks. If the vibrio is a pacifist and does not attack the Pseudomonas, the Pseudomonas just as well would li live peacefully and coexist. And this may actually reflect ecological decisions that are made by bacteria to form mixed biofilms together, either in the extracellular environment or perhaps even inside uh, the human host, where they coexist in large, diverse communities. We were able to show that this conclusion was correct by performing an experiment where three different color cells were mixed together. We mixed red vibrio cholera that were type 6 positive and therefore aggressive cells with green vibrio cholera that were type 6 negative and therefore cooperative cells. And finally, gray colored or, or dark colored Pseudomonas aeruginosa that had the job of differentiating who was who. And surprisingly, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa did a wonderful job of killing only the red cells in this mixed population, never touching the vibrios that were cooperative and not attacking Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This really proves that the system is extraordinarily good at detecting the attacking cell and killing only that cell while causing no collateral damage. Based on the detailed microscopy analysis and genetic analysis we performed, we've developed a model for what actually type 6 dueling represents. The model begins with the apparatus assembling the vibrio cholera cell and firing in the direction of a pseudomonas cell. That firing event apparently perturbs the membrane in the target pseudomonas cells to activate a regulatory system that we identified as being responsible for sensing the attack. That regulatory system transmits the signal to another protein through a phosphorylation event. At that point, Pseudomonas aeruginosa assembles the apparatus in the vicinity of the initial signal and fires back its own type 6 apparatus at the offending vibrio cholera cell. This repeated firing occurs until the Pseudomonas cell no longer detects any threat from the vibrio cholera cell. And at that point, a phosphatase dephosphorylates a key protein in the regulatory cascade, resulting in the turn down of type 6 activity in the pseudomonas cell. When we first embarked upon this work, we were really surprised to find out that bacteria can respond to each other in, in such an intimate and dynamic way over such short periods of time. This was really the exciting part of this whole study, was really to recognize that in complex communities of bacteria, be they in the environment or inside the host, these sorts of pitched battles are going on to uh, establish themselves in mixed biofilms to compete with each other and to see the dynamic activity uh, in real time was really one of the most uh, gratifying experiences in my scientific career. Well, thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. I'm honored to be able to be here with you this afternoon. And um, in the interest of full disclosure to the audience, I was actually one of John's first students. And I had the distinct benefit or pleasure of sharing a bench with John for quite a while. Um, and that was great fun, although he really had a tendency to bench creep. And I kind of had to try <laughs> to control that a little bit. But all was good. And I think for me, it was a great experience to um, have gone through that because I could witness your joy in discovery and doing science firsthand. Um, and yeah. I and my own same opinion of you <laughs> being one. This is always an argument in the lab as to whether she was the number one or number two based upon a rotation date. <laughs> It's wonderful. Yeah. It was great fun. And I'll tell you, being in the lab um, and talking science all the time was just the most fun. And um, 
it was it was very special. But I, I wonder though if you still are able to get out to the bench because I know that that's all I ever think about is when can I get back out to the bench. Well, I, I really do still enjoy bench work very, very much. Um, the uh, the skill set's not so much there anymore uh, between, <laughs> you know, picking colonies used to be tedious, yeah. but at least to be done accurately. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is no longer the case. Yeah. So, so between uh, micro pipetting and, and uh, picking colonies yeah. and doing some of the things that were very, you know, gratifying and fun and allowed you to see results right away. Um, I haven't been doing that, but I did play some phages within the last two years and Pretty it good. was it was successful. It was a successful experiment. <laughs> right. um, so when you were starting your lab back in 1981, which is probably a lot of people here weren't here yet, um, the department there at Harvard really had a lot of very prominent geneticists, including people like John Beckwith. Um, and the integration of microbiology into microbial sciences um, was pretty much in its infancy. But, you know, from a very early point, you were really trying to combine bacterial genetics and molecular biology. Um, and to use these tools as conceptual approaches to studying all sorts of things. And I'm just wondering if you, what that experience was like for you and did you experience any pushback at the time? Well, it's, it was a very interesting time as Regina noted, uh, many in the audience were alive at that time. So let's just say that this was at the, the dawn of recombinant DNA research and there were still a lot of worries about uh, this amazing technology for being able to clone genes and, and ask questions in unique ways. Everyone was thinking superbugs, super pathogens would emerge from um, you know, this sort of research being done willy nilly. Um, in our field's favor, uh, we certainly cooperated with uh, the recombinant DNA advisory committees and other federal agencies to try to self control, if you will, uh, the types of experiments that were immediately feasible. And for someone like myself, who was really interested in doing things like cloning cholera toxin and understanding how it was regulated. Um, yeah, we really felt like our hands were tied and you came to the lab around that same time and the department that we lived in, um, you know, they were among the best bacterial geneticists, if not the best bacterial geneticists in the world. Uh, but primarily focused on E. coli with uh, maybe a few other organisms tossed in. Suffice to say that recombinant DNA technology for them uh, <laughs> picked up a, a useful name. It was called punk genetics. And the idea that uh, folks that were not classically uh, trained to do a three-factor cross or map uh, by P1 transduction, uh, the the adjacency of two genes or two mutations uh, really empowered these punks to be able to do pretty sophisticated experiments right away. So one punk was right here, as a matter of fact, and she really won them over because she built a LAX-Z fusion to the cholera toxin promoter and then cloned the regulatory gene that controlled cholera toxin. And that, that accomplishment really opened the floodgates for our lab because then even the post, even the trainees of the folks that were calling us punk genetics wanted to come work for us. <laughs> so the late Ron Taylor, I think many in the audience remember Ron Taylor, he was the second postdoc in my lab and he came from Tom Sohavi's lab, classic genetics, but Ron was just intrigued by the fact that we could finally do genetics really sophisticated genetics on difficult organisms, pathogens, and really developed an environment that allowed us to win over any, any critics that remained that we could do this responsibly and we could discover some really cool stuff yeah. with it. And we did. And we did. <laughs> <laughs> but but kind of along those lines, I uh, remember when I was starting at UCLA, uh, my first faculty position, um, and almost everybody there was working on E. coli or, or phage, and they really couldn't understand why I was trying to do 
virulence gene regulation in a non-E. coli organism because it was harder. <laughs> what was the point? And that they since realized that we learned a lot of things for studying things besides E. coli. Um, but anyway, I want, I, sort of like looking back over your CV and taking a bird's eye view um, of your research over the years, and it seems like phage kept coming up, you know, periodically over and over um, with you really trying to look at its role in virulence and pathogen evolution. And, and I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about sure. why that, why you got interested in that and, and really what you've discovered. Well, I'll, I'll be dating myself again with this discussion, I'm afraid, it's because okay. um, my first um, real experience in bench science came when I was an undergraduate at UCLA in the Romig lab, as you mentioned. Um, Bob Romig was one, one of my co-advisors along with John Collier when I finally did my PhD work. But before that, I was a glassware washer and a media maker yep. in a cholera phage lab. So Romig uh, believed that the cholera toxin genes were going to be encoded by a phage. And it turned out he was right. But they couldn't prove it with the methods that they had at the time. And then I was making all this media and soft auger and so on and so forth. And I was interested in trying to do some experiments. And it turns out that in the end, I had a pretty good hands, and uh, they put me to work as an undergraduate plating phages and trying to turn Vibro cholera into a more, uh, let's just say, genetically facile organism. So I started learning techniques at the time, like how to use a transposon and how to, you know, you know study a plasmid and, and conjugation and so on. And it occurred to me at the time also that if we were going to study these phages, we really needed to understand the organism too, because one thing that was really weird was the phages would form really clear plaques on a vibrio that was passaged in a rabbit. If you passage this frame in a rabbit and then plated the phage, beautiful clear mm -hmm. plaques. But if you grew the organism in the laboratory, uh, you'd get these turbid, yucky plaques that, that real phage people hate, you know, <laughs> generally. Suffice to say that that taught me that I needed to learn how to passage the of cholera in rabbits. And that's how regulation yeah. in my head yeah. uh, blew up because when you passage the of cholera from one intestinal rabbit to the next intestine, it gets more and more virulent and its properties change in an inheritable way. And the phages are just telling you these bugs are different now. So I, I really just always had that, I love the idea that phages understood mm -hmm. our bugs better than yeah. we did. Yeah. So our nose is always out there trying to find uh, the role of phage. And I was lucky to have a fantastic postdoc, Matthew Waldor in the lab, who came to me with results one day that said that the cholera toxin genes marked with the canamycin could move from one strain to another strain and scary <laughs> and it was scary at the time but but immediately it, the light went off and it, it said it's got to be a phage this is going to be in the supernatant we finally got a pair of strings that yeah. work so it turned out it was a phage but it was a really weird phage it was a non-plaque forming phage it was a filamentous virus that could form lysogens mm -hmm. so really weird phageology that just con continued to get weirder and weirder as the years went on. It was, uh, it, it turns out now we know that really uh, through the work of fantastic collaborator Shah Farooq in Bangladesh as well, that that the way Vibrio cholera ultimately acquires the phage that encodes cholera toxin requires not only the CTX phage, but it requires multiple different satellite phages that do all kinds of interesting re-engineering of the chromosome to allow the vibrio cholera phage to integrate. But that phage can't even get into vibrio cholera unless the vibrio cholera expresses a receptor that turns out to be the colonization right. factor that Ron Taylor and Virginia and I eventually characterized called toxin co-regulated pillows, the filament of type four pillows. So then the, the weird, you know, co-evolution of growth in vivo required for this pillows, a toxin that comes in on a phage that recognizes the pillows and everything's all coordinated 
in vivo. I mean, it yeah. just continued to shock us over and yeah. over again mm -hmm. as to how amazingly co-evolved these virulence factors were to work together. Well, that's what makes it fun. Oh, absolutely made it fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of another theme that comes out in your your uh, career, which you touch very peripherally on just now, is is an interest in really looking at in vivo expression and how that can be very different than in the lab. And just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and, yeah. and what you've learned over the years looking at that. Well, um, as I said, I, I I really you know was always fascinated by the idea that these bugs seem to understand when to express the important stuff. And uh, to give you an example, again, most of our cholera strains you grow in laboratory media, they do not make much cholera toxin, and they hardly ever express TCP pili. But when you put them in vivo, they certainly express both of those. And if you knock those gene products out, you get in vivo phenotypes. So the bug knows where it is and, and knows when to express these factors. So that, that always convinced me that this general concept that pathogenic bacteria understand how to engage with the host environment to optimize the expression of the programs that enhance the replication and virulence, that concept was always there. But uh, you know, the aha moment happens once in a while and when Mike Mann and Jim Slaw were in the lab and showed me some interesting data on, on competition between different organisms in vivo, it suddenly occurred to us that, wait a second, if we can select this gene in vivo, then we can fuse this gene to random promoters and discover which promoters are turned on in vivo. Well, that was the, that was the science paper that yeah. won that prize. That was the IVET technology in vivo expression technology. But a word of advice to everyone in the audience, no matter how far you think scientific techniques are today, they will advance again. It's inevitable. So believe it or not, our best paper is completely you know, obsolete by transcriptomics yeah. now <laughs> because you wanna know what's expressed in vivo? Simple, just you know, sequence the RNAs that are expressed in vivo. But even that is gonna go away someday oh, yeah. it's almost inevitable something even better is coming down the pike so just be ready for it yeah, definitely good advice um so we do have a lot of of young people here a lot of people very early in their career and i i'm wondering since you've had a very successful career and it's continuing um whether you had any advice for them starting out yeah well uh first of all you're in a great field so stay here uh I think I think uh, microbio microbiology <laughs> microbiology is not going anywhere, as we can see uh, from the emergence of these new viral pathogens. I think uh, new bacterial pathogens emerging and understanding the role of microbiome. These are all fascinating problems that you can build your career on. Uh, in regard to picking the problems you want to work on, get advice. Talk to people that have been in the field for a while. When you have a crazy idea, run it by people. They can sometimes give you some perspective on the, that idea. But in the end, trust your gut. Honestly, you guys are in the trenches. You're doing the, the research uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. If something smells interesting, trust your gut that it probably is interesting. And once in a while, do an experiment that your advisor doesn't want you yes. to do. <laughs> but don't tell them ahead of time. <laughs> You just blame me. Mechelon said to do that <laughs> experiment. And sometimes you'll discover something where the advisor will be the, the one that will be, you know, jumping off the up and down and popping champagne bottles yeah. because you were smart enough to do the experiment. So yeah, that's true. Stay optimistic. Yeah. So if you could do it all over again, is there anything you would change? Well, I've had a wonderful career and I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that define a career, not just the scientific discoveries, but the fantastic trainees that I've had the experience of working with. I've learned more from my trainees than I taught them. Famous words from Stan Falco, but absolutely true that we all, uh, we all are dependent on each other for advancing knowledge. And that, that part of the career, I wouldn't change. I'm 
In fact, I think if I had something to change, I'd probably have more trainees, not less mm -hmm. trainees, try to figure out a way to do but that. You gotta leave some for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I regret um, is that I didn't take a sabbatical. Uh, I had plenty of opportunities to take multiple sabbaticals in my long career. I never did it. Uh, I see colleagues that are dear to my heart that uh, are big, we've always been big believers at sabbaticals. Uh, folks like Stephen Laurie, who might be out there in the audience, uh, did I think three sabbaticals at the pastor and uh, learned something new at every one of those and brought back uh, new problems to study and advance uh, dramatically. Uh, while learning to speak French, <laughs> uh, and many other French wine. <laughs> yeah, many other many other colleagues have done sabbaticals with e equal uh, success stories, and some of them just had just a lot of fun too. Uh, Marty Blazer uh, went to Japan and uh, became fluent in Japan and became fluent in playing the Japanese game Go. Uh, I really envy that someone who can you know mix mix uh, a scientific career with uh, with some fun on the side and learn a, a difficult language to boot. Yeah. So unfortunately, I'm not bilingual. I know how to say hello in probably 20 languages and goodbye in 20 languages. But, but uh, I'm I'm uh, really regret that I didn't spend time in a foreign location doing science and really immersing myself in another culture. Well, I know science is a big part of your your life but i also know that you also like to play and I'm wondering if you could share with people what what uh, your favorite for, recreation is yeah. well um it, it's not uh, a secret to the folks that have trained in my laboratory that uh, we used to have a poker game on fridays and i'm a big believer in in fun as a group but i i love uh i love the game of texas hold'em and Believe it or not, uh, we were playing Texas Hold'em before it became so damn popular. <laughs> Remember that, Vic? <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, we didn't start any websites for the game, but we would have been very well off had we uh, anticipated the, the rise in popularity of that one game. So yes, I, I do like to play poker. I also like to fish. I used to used to have a fishing boat, yeah. and we had many uh, lab parties associated with boating. Uh, and fishing also. And, um, you know, these are the types of recreation that I still love to enjoy, but don't have enough time to do them anymore. Well, They're also. Gotta make time. Yeah, gotta make time. But I, I kind of see a connection between the, the poker and your advice to our young scientists. And I think sometimes when you're playing poker or games of chance, you have to trust your gut. And so I, I think maybe you have a very well honed gut and that maybe accounts for so much of your success. <laughs> well, it seemed to, it seemed to uh, be something that folks could pick up on right away that there was, uh, you know, there was an element of, of trusting your gut and occasionally bluffing, but let's not bluff. <laughs> let's not bluff too much in science. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we've got about 45 seconds left. Is there anything else you want to say? Well, I think, uh, again, I, I, uh, have, I can't thank all the trainees uh, enough. Uh, unfortunately, some of our trainees have gone. Um, Ron Taylor was uh, very dear to all of us. Uh, Marsha Bentley, another uh, wonderful colleague uh, and early uh, person in the McLaughlin's laboratory. I just, I think uh, for me, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better career and and the most wonderful thing about the, your, your trainees is that they really become a second family. We've used this euphemism many times of saying, oh, this person is John's scientific great-grandchild. Well, you know, that implies all my trainees, be they students or postdocs, they're my scientific children and their trainees are my scientific grandchildren and their trainees are my scientific great grandchild children. And I, I just honestly have developed the best friendships with some of the trainees that have come out of my trainees labs. And we're still very close. We still, uh, whenever they're in town, we try to have a dinner or go out for beers or whatever. So I, I, I 
really love the fact that science has to be social in order to be successful. And um, yeah, mentors have relationships with their mentees that can be tough at times, but we try to try to make science fun and it usually is more successful. Yeah. So that's my word of advice. I agree. And I think that's a great note to end on and to congratulate you once again. Thanks again. Good night. Please welcome ASM Microbe Program Committee Co-Chair Kumaran Ramamurthy. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome back uh, to Microbe uh, 2022. Uh, so this year's meeting is uh, especially dear to me, aside from the obvious reasons, uh, because uh, coincidentally, uh, it's being held in Washington, D.C. And as it turns out, uh, you know, my lab is uh, just a few miles that way at the NIH. So I really do feel like I'm welcoming all of you uh, to spend a few days with me in my own backyard. So if you do see me along the, you know, hallway somewhere, feel free to stop me and uh, say hello uh, and let me, things, uh, uh, let me know how things are going. Uh, I'd really love to meet each and every one of you. Uh, so it is my distinct honor today uh, to introduce our opening session speaker, uh, Dr. Yasmin Belkade, uh, fellow NIH'er. Uh, so Dr. Belkade received her PhD from the Pasteur Institute, uh, where she studied uh, immune responses uh, to Leishmania infections, uh, so a single bacterium. Uh, after a postdoc at the NIH, uh, she was briefly at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and returned then uh, to the NIH uh, as a faculty member uh, where she's been ever since, and she's currently uh, the director of the NAID uh, microbiome program. Uh, and her lab continues uh, to lead the way uh, in the efforts at understanding um, how uh, the immune system uh, interacts with the microbiome. Uh, so Dr. Belkade has way too many honors and awards for me to list here today, but I will point out that she uh, has recently won the Robert Koch Prize uh, and the Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Yasmin Belkade. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and it's extraordinary honor to be here today, although I didn't know if I was invited to give a speech speech or actually to sing based on the, <laughs> the entrance. <laughs> but anyway, it's a real privilege for me to, do, to be here today and to discuss some of the work we have been doing over the last few years, trying to explore this absolutely fascinating relationship between the microbiota and the immune system. And I may have my first slide coming, yes. Right. And I'm gonna discuss with you some of this extraordinary language that is utilized uh, by the microbes to actually communicate with the immune system and how they can exploit the immune system as a way to really create and amplify tissue physiology. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. So over the last, um, let's say 15 years, has been really a true revolution in the field of immunology. And this deep understanding that really the immune system was profoundly entwined with our microbes which means that the development of our immune system, its function, its fine tuning in tissue relies on this coexistence with these microbes that have seeded every bare tissue from birth. We're very lucky quite a few years ago now to stumble into the observation that the microbes that live in our GI tract can act as an adjuvant of the immune system and promote adaptive immune responses to pathogen. In addition, of course, of the extraordinary work of this microbe as a shield against pathogen. 
What work that has been done actually in few uh, environments, in particular by Bali Pulendrum recently, highlighted the role of the microbiota as uh, an ability to manipulate the quality of vaccine response, something that, of course, is dear to our heart today in the context of the current pandemic. And what was actually shown is that the quality of the antibody and the glycosylation pattern, and thereby the ability to neutralize virus, could be actually conditioned by the quality of the microbe present. What has been also shown and really mentioned earlier in the introduction, I think is absolutely fascinating and really one of the most extraordinary highlights of the microbiome and the immune system is its ability to promote immune response uh, to immune checkpoint therapy and immunotherapy. Some work that was done by numerous investigators, including Giorgio turing Carey at the NIH, showed that if you collect the microbiota of non-responders to, immune, to uh, immune checkpoint therapy, actually the responders, and transfer them to non-responder, you can actually confer susceptibility to the treatment. So really extraordinary finding as a proof principle that just the microbiota transfer may have the ability to amplify response. But of course, the issue is, of course, that the microbiome that live at all surfaces can also act as amplifiers of inflammatory disorders, and that has been highlighted in numerous uh, settings, including inflammatory bowel disease, but also in the context of allergy and autoimmune disorders. So before continuing, I just wanted to actually highlight three extraordinary scientists that I had the privilege to train that really helped me to enter into this field when I really started that 15 years ago. And those actually have started since then their own group in various places. I just wanted to highlight uh, the work of Tim, Shruti, and Jason. So what I'm going to discuss with you today is not just how the microbiota control the immune system, but a question that we became quite fascinated about over the last few years, which is how the microbe communicate with the immune system in a way that induces immune responses. And I'm going to explain to you why, for me, who is actually traveling between microbiology and, and immunology, this was a paradox. This was a paradox because postulate that was done by immunologists, and that was the work of Genoa, for example, or Pauli Matzinger at the NIH, was that in order for the immune system to recognize a microbe, what was needed is tissue damage and inflammation. And those damage acted as an adjuvant and allowed the system to be engaged and respond. And this class of immunity is, of course, the one that goes back in the tissue and control the invading agent. This very same class of immunity is the one that is linked to inflammatory disorders and, 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 and tissue damage. But this was a paradox. This was a paradox because the microbiota that live in the bare surfaces, in the skin, the GI tract, and so forth, is able to induce immune responses. The work of Andrew McPherson, for example, and many others highlighted that this microbe were able to induce antibody responses, but also T cell responses. But this happened in complete absence of inflammation. So this really raised this extraordinary paradox, which is how the immune system is able to communicate with the immune system in a way that engages responses and led to address numerous questions. One of them is what are the unique property and function of an immune response that really has nothing to do with the control of the invading agent. There is no invading agent, it's at the external surface of the body. And the second, what is the mechanism by which this microbe are able to engage the immune system? So today I'm going to discuss with you some of the work we have actually recently published on this original sin, the mechanism. And I'm going to actually also discuss with you some non-published data that are referring to a new function of immunity to the microbiome in the, in, the in the control of host physiology. So just to summarize the work of quite a few years, uh, that was done in the laboratory and that was very much initiated by a really remarkable student in the laboratory, Shruti Naik, utilizing the skin, and this was very much inspired by the really seminal work of Julie Segre and Heidi, Heidi Kong at the NIH when they were actually discovering the, the, the diversity of the skin microbiome. Together with them, we were able to show that if you take a new microbe, like for example, Staphylococcus epidermidis or other microbe, and you apply them at the surface of the skin of an animal that didn't have this microbe before, in the context of its own endogenous microbiota, the immune system sees that and is able to develop T cell responses that go back to the tissue. And in this specific slide, as you can see, the T cells go to the epidermal layer and they can produce cytokines that stimulate the keratinocyte for the production of antimicrobial peptide. And the tissue become enhance this ability to be protected against subsequent infection. So this really a heterologous protection that is afforded by an immune response to the skin microbiota. But subsequently work that was done by John and Mike and also Oli in the laboratory that since then have actually started their own group, showed that these cells were actually not only here to enhance immunity of the tissue, but also were incredibly plastic and can change their function to allow the tissue to regenerate and heal better in the context of injury. 
So this was clearly a different class of immunity that was not inflammatory, that had the ability to enhance antimicrobial defenses, but also to promote the fundamental function of the host, which is the repair process that is necessary for host survival. So this led us, of course, with numerous questions. And one of them, which I referred earlier on as this original sin, was how does microbes are able to engage the immune system in such a quiet central? So the first potential idea and the first potential uh, clue about this phenomenon and this mechanism came from a microarray, uh, microarray, what am I talking about? Like <laughs> for RNA-seq data of keratinocytes that was done by Samira Kamutumur when she was in the laboratory, when she applied the microbe at the surface of the skin and five days later purified the keratinocytes and looked at the signature that was imposed on the tissue. And what she was able to show is that very surprising, there is no inflammation, there is no neutrophils, no monocytes, but the tissue responds as if it was infected by a virus. And it was a really, really strange phenomenon. Here is a bacteria that is not causing inflammation, that is not infecting, and the tissue develops an antiviral program. So this was not completely surprising. Work that had been done by numerous investigators, including David Aris or Akiko Iwasaki, highlighted that the gut microbiota had the ability to enhance antiviral defenses in the host. And the gut microbiota, for example, can enhance the ability of the host to develop response to virus in the lung. So somehow we already knew of this connection between the microbiota and antiviral responses, but the mechanism underlying this connection remained unclear. And this led us to rethink about, of course, a fundamental phenomenon, which is the fact that, of course, we have this exogenous microbiome, the one that many of us in this room have explored, that is colonizing all the various surfaces, those protozoan, bacteria, fungi, and so forth. But what we also have is an endogenous viral. 10% of our genome is composed of endogenous retroviruses that are really remnant of retroviral infection that have embedded themselves in our genomes. These elements evolutionary have been controlled, neutralized, and actually are no longer infectious, but some of them ma maintain transcription activity and have been linked to various biological function. So this strange antiviral signature we saw in the context of the skin association led us to explore the possibility that maybe there could be a connection between this exogenous microbiome and this endogenous virome. And this connection actually was not completely new. Work that was done by George Cassiotes, that is the Crick Institute uh, in London, had actually already thought and conceptualized this. He actually was able to show that downstream of TLR signaling, there is upregulation of certain ERVs by cells, such as macrophages or B cells. He also had shown that there is actually a difference in the expression of ERVs in germ-free mice, showing that somehow the microbiota influence the expression of these elements. And finally, he also shows something that is absolutely fascinating, that really the ERV expression is highly tissue specific, something that remains to be really explored and understood. So we, we bent back to this concept and decided to revisit that in the context of this association. And this was actually done in a laboratory by an extraordinary team that is JALMA and C, the bioinformatician and its biologist, that team up to really address this question. The first thing they did, a very simple one, that is really somehow to reproduce some of the observation of George by looking at the keratinocyte ERV expression profile in animals that are germ-free, devoid of microbe, or have a microbiota. And not surprisingly, and very much aligned with this finding, we found that it was a change in ERV expression pointing once again to the idea that somehow the microbiota influence ERV expression. But to more directly link uh, this microbiota response and ERV to the response to the microbiota, what we did, what I didn't do anything, what they did is they actually purified the keratinocytes after association with faculty and looked at ERV expression. And they were able to show that it was a discrete but significant upregulation of elements within the keratinocytes of these animals. So those retro elements, those retroviruses, can actually have a life cycle, and they can, in some circumstances, of course, be reverse transcribed, become DNA that will accumulate within the cytoplasm. And DNA cytoplasm accumulation is, of course, a sense of infection that could be sensed by the innate immune system that could now engage this um, element. So to try to see if somehow the ability of this element to become DNA could actually be the microadjuvant in our setting, what we did is we do something quite simple, which is to utilize drugs that are utilized in the context of HIV, which is actually blocking reverse transcriptase activity of the host in this case. So the animals were either controlled, they don't really, they don't have many T cells in the skin because they are not exposed to wild microbiota, as Barbara Redman has actually shown this to us. 
When you apply Staphypia to the surface of the skin, you enhance the accumulation of T cells in the skin compartment. And when you treat the animal with an anti-RT, this is significantly decreased. So this really, really prove and at least support the idea, then really the ability of the immune system to mount a new response to the microbiota depends somehow on this expression of reverse transmitters activity of the host. This can be demonstrated in a more clear way by imaging, where you can see that in the context of an association with staph AP, the skin become more invaded by T cells that lodge themselves in the epidermis. To treat the animal with an anti-RT, there is a profound suppression of this T cell accumulation in the tissue. So once again, somehow antiviral and T cell response to staph AP pointing to a link between this reverse transmittase activity and the ability to mount a neo response to the microbiota. So work that had been done by innate immunologists really had pointed to the canonical and fundamental role of the SIGA sting pathway in the cognition of DNA. And to test the possibility in a non system, this mechanism could account for the response to the microbiota. What Sid and Jalma did is to apply the mice that were deficient in their sensor and looked at immune response to the microbiota. So the wild type mice developed a T cell response to the microbiota. If you have an animal that is uh, deficient in sting or SIGAS, these elements, these mice no longer develop strong response to the microbiota, pointing to the fact that there is really a link between the SIGA sting pathway and retro elements in the context of this response. So, of course, the next question is to try to understand what could be the cells that are responsible for sensing uh, these this, um, this elements. So, of course, what Jalma did is to cross mice with numerous other mice to just be able to delete sting in different cell subset. And I'm showing you, of course, the one that he found was the most relevant, that are keratinocytes. So when he deletes sting expression only by keratinocyte, that is, of course, the most abundant barrier within the skin compartment, he found that actually the ability of the animal to mount a T cell response was actually profoundly decreased. And I don't have a pointer, so you're going to have to actually follow me. So you can see here that uh, the control mice have actually already T cells in the skin, and in absence of sting sensing by keratinocytes, there's a significant decrease of the tonic accumulation of those T cells. If you add staph AP, you enhance these responses that is significantly decreased in the context of this um, deletion. Very much the same thing with the mate cells, another population of lymphocytes that accumulate in the skin in response to the microbiota and is involved in tissue repair. And very much also in the context of the gamma T cell response that is entirely dependent on sting expression by the keratinocytes. So what we have actually um, proposed using this observation was the model that was built at this stage, the following one downstream of TLR expression, and we have actually now evidence, uh, and it was done in collaboration with, um, with um, Michael Fishback and Erin Chen in his laboratory. Downstream of TLR2 expression by keratinocytes, there is a discrete upregulation of ERVs. We still don't really understand why there is such a discrete expression, how this is controlled. This ERV can be reverse transcribed, they become DNA that is now sensed as a viral infection that can be now alerting the immune system. So the keratinocyte, in a very discreet way, become those mini hotspots that allow to engage the immune system and now alert them and allow these T cells to go back in the tissue and broadly promote tissue physiology, enhancing antimicrobial defenses, but also promoting tissue repair. So somehow this relationship with those ancient virus lead to this homeostatic immunity that has beneficial effect on tissue physiology. But this led us to address another question. Of course, we, the ERV expression is known from people that have worked on inflammation that something can contribute to inflammatory damages. For example, in the context of lupus, it has actually been shown in humans, then there is aberrant expression of those elements. And in fact, some of the immune response that happen in the context of lupus can be directed against those retro elements. So what we wanted to see if somehow the ability of the microbiota in a contextual way to trigger pathology could be depending on this ERV expression. And to address this question, what we did is utilize a dietary intervention. I'm going to explain to you what this means. So when you apply the microbe at the surface of the skin of an animal that is fed a regular diet, there is no inflammation, as I mentioned before. There's no thickening of the ear. There is no uh, infiltration of cells. If you change the diet of the animal only for a few weeks, Quite remarkably, the very same microbe that caused absolutely no inflammation now induces inflammation. So that's, I mean, the first time I saw those data, I found that absolutely astonishing. Then just a few weeks change in the diet can transform a microbe from homeostatic to inflammatory. 
So next time you eat too much for a few weeks in vacation, maybe you should think about it. But nonetheless, this actually really highlights the, one of the possible mechanisms by which the microbiota can amplify inflammation in the context of a diet intervention. So this inflammation can be visualized by the thickening of the ear, where you can have a keratinocyte expansion and enhanced proliferation of the keratinocyte. And this is visualized at the bottom of the slide by the expression of K67. So the tissue become more inflamed and thicker. So Sid, of course, reanalyzed this data in the context of high fat diet uh, and was able to actually show that if the animal has a high fat diet plus the bacteria, there is really a strong upregulation of ERVs within the keratinocyte and the different part of, the, of those ERVs. And this can be visualized on the left, but also on the right, where you can see the upregulation of these elements, including, as underlined here, elements that have been proven or at least proposed to have an active reverse transcriptase activity. And this was done in collaboration with George Cassiotex. So the next step was to try to understand if somehow what we have discovered here could account for the inflammatory propensity of the microbiota in the context of this high fat diet challenge. So as I mentioned before, if you apply a microbiota at the surface of the skin of an animal that is fed a high fat diet, it's inducing inflammation. If you have treated this animal with an NTRT, you can significantly decrease inflammation, really proposing that really in this context, this uh, reverse transcriptase activity is at least responsible partially for the inflammatory process that is triggered by this um, bacteria. So I used to think that the scene were complex, but let's face it, it's even more complex. And I really think we are scratching the surface of this complexity. So it's quite fascinating to think that somehow the bacteria have actually co-opted those ancient viral partners as a way to communicate with the immune system in a way to induce our physiology and promote responses in the tissue. So ERV expression, those ancient viral partners, are really an ally on this relationship and are able to actually induce responses, to, promote response to the microbiota. And the C-gastine pathway is responsible for this expression. So I used to refer as the bacteria as the adjuvant of the immune system, but I think this has to be rephrased. The real adjuvant of the immune system are those ancient partners that live within every cell and are regulated in a way that still remains to be fully understood. The model that we have at the moment, and it's of course the model, and as all models can be destroyed by the next set of data, but that's what we have at the moment. As I mentioned before, downstream of TLR2, a prediction of the RV that triggered these responses that lead to this homeostatic immunity. However, in the context of a high fat diet, there is a change in the status of activation of the tissue and now encounter with the very same microbe induce aberrant expression of these elements. Now these elements lead to inflammatory processes that can actually cause this immunopathology within the skin compartment. So it's quite fascinating that just the change in lipid can actually tilt the balance. And of course, this, we are actually now exploring the mechanism by which it's actually happening. But we're also trying to explore this question in the context of numerous settings. We're trying to see, of course, how the diet could actually play a role, how genetic predisposition of the host, and in particular, a host that is less able to actually constrain viruses in particular, could be somehow having aberrant expression of the RV and that could contribute to some of the immunopathology. And we're also looking at how infection can disturb this relationship with those retro elements and how somehow this could account for immunopathology that occur in the context of chronic infection. But what I wanted to share with you is a couple of uh, really early data that shows that actually we're trying to address this question in the context of the human setting. And this is done in collaboration at the Clinical Center with a really remarkable scientist that is Kevin Hall, that is a physicist, that had decided to do that nutritional intervention at the NIH. And what he does is actually place a brain that people are brought to the clinical center and stayed for a couple of months in which they are given specific diets. So it's in fact the most controlled dietary intervention that has ever been done because let's face it, dietary intervention, if you are in a home, you're probably gonna cheat, all of us will cheat. So this is a very, very controlled intervention. But what is remarkable is looking at the, so the, the first part of the, the story has been actually published in the context of this metabolic rewiring of the individual. And now we're looking at the immune system together with Verena in the laboratory. And what is actually incredible is that when you place the animal on a vegan diet or on a ketogenic, there is actually opposing responses. So for example, the vegan diet promote innate responses well, the ketogenic is actually imposing more an adaptive immune responses. And I found that quite remarkable because it was not a very large study. These were individuals from very different backgrounds, with different sex, different heights, different age. Nonetheless, it was this conserved response. So if anyone had doubt about the power of nutrition in shaping our immune system, I think this is something that you may want to rethink. 
So why am I telling you that? I am telling you that because when Verena analyzed the ERV expression, she was able to show that the class of genes that were the most affected by nutrition was actually the ERVs. So, and this is actually showing on the, on the left, on the what, whatever the heck, um, here, that there is actually, of course, a different pattern of expression between individual, which is quite interesting to start with. And the second, when she placed the, when placed the individual in different diet, at the level of the monocyte, there is this extraordinary change in the ERV expression at the level of these cells. So, of course, we don't really know at this stage if this can account for this immunological impact, but nonetheless, it's quite remarkable that something as simple as a diet can actually alter the expression of this element that can somehow control our immune system. So, of course, much more remains to be done, but this is an area that we're really excited to move forward. For the next five, ten minutes, I just wanted to discuss with you some unpublished work that relate to the discovery of a completely new function of immunity to the microbiota, something that we're quite fascinated about. And as I mentioned before, we have actually shown before that when the immune system sends this microbe, there is this adaptive immune responses, and it's a different class of immune responses that control host physiology. So we wanted to somehow try to see if we could discover a novel function of this relationship. And this was done in the laboratory, a remarkable postdoctoral fellow, Michel, who became fascinated by Staphylococcus aureus. And of course, many of you here have worked on this microbe, that, and many of you have worked on the pathogenic aspect of this microbe, but let's face it, Staph aureus, and of course, some of them are clearly commensals. And what I'm referring here today is Staph aureus as a commensal. So the, this, this one was isolated from mouse, does not cause inflammation. And what Michel postulated is that Staph, because of its different lifestyle that can eventually cause inflammation and disease, may be partially well suited to induce the class of immune response that could prepare the host for subsequent tissue damage. So to address this question and to see if somehow this could be the case, Michel generated new tools and in particular made a mice in which all the T cells are specific for antigen that are expressed by Staph aureus, allowing, allowing him to track the behavior of these cells when he transfer them in an animal. So we take the animal, apply them in staph at the surface of the skin. This bacteria does not cause any inflammation. This is not a model of infection. This is not in a, in a, in a closed room. This is basically just planting at the surface of the skin. And he looked at the T cell response. As you can see, then those T cells enter into the skin and they accumulate and they mostly develop at what is referred as type 17 responses. What's something that is very classical for immune response to the microbiota. But what was not classical? is when Michel started to look at where the cells reside and where they are in the tissue. And I'm sorry, but the movie is not working. And if it was working, you could see that the T cells visualized in yellow tend to be in close proximity from sensory neurons. So every tissue, and in particular the skin, is densely innervated by sensory neurons that of course play a fundamental function, not only in, in the sensing and, and, and actually a sensation, but also in coordinating numerous processes in the tissue. And what Michel was able to show is that these T cells tend to be in close proximity to sensory neurons within the skin. And if you compare that to the vessel, for example, they are less in contact with them. So they have this association, sometimes really attachment to sensory neurons. So Michel purified the T cells uh, that uh, from the skin of this animal that was specific for staph aureus and looked at the gene expression profile. And what he was able to show is that remarkably, those T cells not only have this tissue repair profile that can of course induce regeneration of tissue, but they also have this nerve interaction and repair profile. So somehow the T cells generated against the microbiota in staph aureus can have this ability to connect, at least in theory, with the nerves. So this led Michel to explore the possibility that somehow immunity to this microbe could serve the purpose of regenerating, the regenerating neuron in the context of injury. So then we have a tissue damage, a tissue damage that is caused by an infection or by a breach of the barrier. We don't have a damage of one system, we have a damage of all the system, which is destroying the keratinocytes, the, the, the vasculature, the, the destroying also the, the, the nerves, of course. So Michel utilizes this very simple model of punch biopsy at the surface of the skin. And you can visualize here, then there is regeneration of the nerves at the periphery that create this ring, a regeneration ring at the periphery. And you can see also this extraordinary infiltrate of cells highlighting once again the power of the immune system in really promoting those factors of regeneration. So utilize this approach to look at how staph aureus could potentially enhance this process. So we did a very simple experiment first. When you take an animal, and you apply staph aureus at the surface of the skin, 
you allow the microbe to persist. It persists at very low biomass. It's actually really present for a few weeks. And then you did the punch biopsy, very simple experiment. And you can see on the first one uh, on the top in the control, and of course there is cells that accumulate around the edge of the wound. And this is of course accelerated in the context of staph aureus association. You can also see that the beta tubulin that labels all the nerves in the skin is actually happening at the edge of the wound. And you can see on the bottom that there is really acceleration and densification of the sensory neuron in the context of staph aureus association. And this could be actually quantified uh, on the right. So of course, at this stage, you know, especially as microbiology, like well, staph aureus produce so many things, it may be a direct effect of the microbe. And of course, that could be a possibility. So we decided to see if it was something produced by the microbe or something that would happen through the immune system. So to address this question, what Michel did is utilize animal in which you can delete the ability of the T cells to produce cytokine and especially Al-17 when they enter in the tissue. And that's actually a mice that express oxprolin. So by using this approach, the cells no longer produce Al-17 when they enter in the tissue. So uh, on this, I don't know if I'm on the left or the right, okay, whatever, on this side, <laughs> you can see then actually the animal that is naive have a reconstitution of the neurons. If you apply staph, staph virus on the surface of the skin, there is a massive acceleration of the repair process and really densification of the tissue. If you go on the other side, it's actually where the, the mice no longer have those T cells able to produce TH17, IL-17. And you can see how here then actually this regeneration is severely decreased. And this can be quantified on the right. So how does it work? Um, the T cell, it could actually happen because somehow the T cells communicate with macrophages. Macrophages are an extraordinary population of cells that tend to have been involved in numerous repair processes. So to try to see if it was a direct or indirect effect, what Michel did is to eliminate the, is actually to look first at what happened on the level of the DRG. So sensory neurons that are present in all the tissues, the fibers are connected to the DRG that are not only connecting this fiber, but also transmitting information uh, to the CNS. So all the, the, the gene expression happened at the level of the DRG. So Michel purified the DRG from an animal that had been, ex that had been injured or not injured. And you can see here uh, on, on the mice that have received an injury, then those DRG, those nuclei, will express this ATF3, which is a transcription factor that has been shown before to coordinate regeneration of neurons. But what was really, really interesting is that in addition of that, he was able to show that those neurons also upregulate the receptor for IL-17. So somehow, tissue damage and inflammation and injury allow the neuron now to open and allow the responsiveness to the cytokine that is produced by the T cells that are induced by the macrobiota. So what is quite remarkable is if you go and we re-evaluated um, publicly available data set in the context of all the kind of injury in spinal, uh, spinal nerve transection, previously this data demonstrated that this IL-17 receptor expression also occurs in the context of other injury, supporting the idea that maybe this may be a conserved response um, to the injury of nerves. So what is extremely important, of course, is to prove that 17 can act directly on the nerves. And for that, um, Michel eliminated the receptors from uh, the sensory neuron of the skin using mice that express a specific uh, free system. On the top, the mice are applied with staphyris, and they have this massive regeneration. You can see the CGRP expression that labels specifically the sensory neurons. If the animal no longer have nerve that can sense our 17, you can see how decreased this response is. And this is also true for CGRP. And this is actually quantified on the right. So the nerves need to express the receptor to actually be able to mediate this repair process, which in fact hadn't been uh, shown before. So the model that uh, we're building right now, based on this observation, is the following one. The macrobiota has an extraordinary ability to induce immune responses in tissues. If you apply, if you respond to a new microbe, you have a large amount of T cells that go there that produce, that can actually potentially produce IL-17. These cells are in close proximity to sensory neuron. And we have ongoing work in the laboratory that shows that there is really active molecule produced by the neuron that actually allow to attract those T cells. So there is really, it's a, it's a bi-directional situation. If you have an injury, an infection, the microbe is still there at the surface of the skin. So now, the immune system sees that there is an infection and can be repaired. And these T cells amplify massively, produce cytokine, 
and in this case, R17, that can act directly on the sensory neuron that have been injured. These neurons have upregulated the ability to sense R17 and is engaged in a fundamental process of regeneration of the sensory neuron pathway. And this is really important for numerous reasons. Of course, because repair of nerves is an extremely important process that needs to occur every time we have an injury. But the sensory neurons also serve the purpose of coordinating epithelial repair, but also the vasculature repair. So having the neuron regenerating can actually allow the entire tissue to repair. And this really proposed really then the macrobiota is able to induce a class of immunity that triggers multi-system repair, which is, I think, quite fascinating. So to conclude this talk, uh, we proposing really then the macrobiota when it's encountering uh, the, 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 the tissue is able in a very discreet way to engage this ERV expression. Thus, ERV, so somehow there is this remarkable collaboration between this exogenous microbiome and these ancient viral partners. This relationship somehow allow this expansion of T cells, and that means that the microbes are exploiting the power of the immune system to divide and expand as a way to communicate and promote physiology. This induced numerous biological processes, enhancement of immune responses, epithelial repair, and as I have mentioned here, neuronal regeneration. And we can actually propose, based on the latest finding, that maybe R17 could become a therapeutic target. We could imagine then we may utilize L17 as a way to regenerate neurons, something that, of course, is of fundamental importance for, for clinical health. We could also think that people that suffer from neuropathy, it may be important to limit those pathways as a way to prevent aberrant regeneration of neurons in the context of chronic inflammation. But more importantly, the reason I wanted to actually show you this story is because I feel that there is an enormous power in just observing microbes to potentially discover the logic of tissues. These microbes have co-evolved with us. They have co-evolved their immune system, and they have developed extraordinary methods to actually create and amplify physiology and really protect the tissue. So I truly believe that we have just to look at them functioning. And within this relationship, we can really develop insight into the logic of the immune system, the logic of repair, and maybe devise therapeutic strategy that are very much based on this interaction. So on that, I really think then as a community, and it was mentioned before, we're scratching the surface of this interaction, the microbiome and the immune system and all virtual system. When, you know, a few years ago, I think all of us were a bit arrogant to think that we had understood everything. In fact, I think we are very beginning of an extraordinary field of investigation. And for all the trainee here, I think there is so much to do in terms of mechanistic insight. So I am absolutely convinced this is just the beginning of a long journey and numerous, numerous discoveries that will be made of many of you here. So on that, I have to thank all the extraordinary people I had the privilege to work with. Uh, I have highlighted the work of Jalma and Sid, but of course the work also of Michelle. I mentioned some of the past wonderful trainees that have paved the way for them to continue this work. Uh, this long journey on the skin microbiota started with Julie Segre quite a few years ago, and this has been the beginning of a very long friendship and long collaboration. We had numerous collaboration over the years. Uh, George Cassiotes was very the person that introduced us to the wonderful world of those additional retroviruses. Ongoing collaboration with Michael Fishback with the manipulation of the bacteria to try to understand the mechanism of interaction with the immune system. And Erin Chen, who's actually just starting her laboratory at MIT. Um, and also wonderful collaborators at the NIH in neuroscience. One of the great joy of working at the NIH is that there is always extraordinary scientists in many different fields that we can collaborate with. And this is really fantastic to open new horizon. I apologize, this was an immunology talk at the ASM. I hope I didn't really, uh, and you are still here, you haven't all left, so this is wonderful. And thank you very much for your attention. So we have uh, three microphones, um, and we have time for a couple of questions for uh, Gabelle Cade. So please come on up and ask your questions. I've been instructed to sit. So. And bonus, if it's if you identify yourself as a trainee, uh, I promise to buy you a beer afterwards. I'm serious. <laughs> so as we're waiting for questions, I have a quick one then. Um, so uh, uh, since you mentioned immunology versus uh, you know uh, microbes. Uh, was the response that you saw uh, strain specific for the staph aureus that you use? And did you find mutants that didn't do this? Yes, of course, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say that to this audience. And of course, this one microbe is actually billions of microbes. 
So of course, there is actually strain specificity, and some of them are better than others. But we found that actually the commonalities, any microbe that induces type 17 responses can do that. So this, of course, such a fundamental process should not be under the constraint of one single strain. So this is really very much concerned to all microbes that induce type 17 responses. Very good. Wonderful talk. I want to ask about the first part. Um, you mentioned it's TLR2 that induces the retro elements. Do you think it will happen also in TLR4? Yes, it does happen also with TLR4. In all specific context, it's TLR2. But what is really remarkable and was shown actually by George Cassiotis a few years ago is downstream of TLR signaling, you can upregulate TRV. What is unbelievably, I think, exciting is every cell subset upregulate different class of ERV. So I think what is going to be upstream is going to be relatively canonical. Quite few, quite few sensors can actually induce it. But what really is the regulator of these responses is the cell subset. And this is something we are quite fascinated about, is why different cell subsets will express different class of ERV and how this could account for the different ability of this element to, to respond. Entire type 1 interferon, the antiviral response, is due to these ERVs, or is it some element that is due to the bacterial response? Oh, very good. Of course, many of you do know that those, those, retro those anti RT can act also on some bacteria, which will have a function. So it could absolutely account in other settings. In this specific example, Staphylococcus was not impacted, and we had actually proven that. But this is a very fascinating question when you think about these treatments that are given to millions of people worldwide. If they really have an impact on the immune system plus the bacteria, I don't really think we really understand exactly what this really means and how this could account for some of the long-term consequence of some of these drugs in the context of metabolic disorder or cardiovascular disease. So yes, absolutely. I think it's something to take in account in the context of the gut microbiota in particular. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, sorry. I am a trainee, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you afterwards. Well, I'm not sitting because he's not sitting. So. Um, the ERVs, are they expressed kind of across the board, or are different ERVs responding, say, to different commensals? It's responding to what? Different commensals, so if there's... Oh, yeah, 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 so yes, absolutely. So that's also another layer of complexity. Different commensals will induce, so if we did that in the skin, and I think that's why I think there is this kaleidoscope of, of control. So different microbes can induce different TLR, and we're not a different ERV, and we're not really sure to understand actually how this is regulated. I, I think this, this work for us opened the door of this Pandora box of, of, of questions, which is really how this is regulated. If each cell expresses different ERVs, and if different microbes can actually induce different ERVs, how all of that is regulated? And how does relationship account for the diversity of our immune system? You know, all of us respond differently to diet or vaccines or so something that will remain to be explored. So yes, different bacteria induce different ERVs. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, wonderful talk. I was wondering how uh, the regeneration story might play a role into places that maybe don't have a microbiome such as the brain. There's a bit of an echo, so maybe if you can go closer to the microphone. That would... So I was wondering about the kind of the regeneration story, um, but how it might play a role in places that don't have a microbiome, such as the brain. Oh, in the brain. So basically the relationship between that and the brain in the context of the neuron, neuronal interaction, that's what you're mentioning? Yes, but it wouldn't yes. necessarily have the microbiome in close proximity. Yes, yes, of course, it's been some gorgeous work, you know, done by people that have linked, of course, the gut, this gut, gut uh, brain access. And so we don't really know at this stage, but we have actually interesting evidence that the microbiota induce population of cells that can travel back within the meninges. So, it is very early stage telling you that it has an impact, we don't know. But what we also know is, of course, sensory neurons have also a capacity to actually interact with the brain itself. So there is actually other layers of control that, that are likely to occur. Um, at the moment, there are speculation, but this is really something that will be fascinating to explore. So in the interest of time, one last question. All right, great. I know my postdoc, so I'm also looking forward to Awesome. The, the um, are there any efforts to look and see if Sorry, who's speaking? Uh, over on the right yeah. side. Uh, yes. Are there any efforts to see if other bacteria might launch an even stronger neurological repair process? So stronger, so 
So, sorry, I'm so sorry about the sound is a bit difficult. Yeah. I'm curious if uh, there are any efforts to screen if there are different bacterial species that might induce an even, an even stronger neurological repair response. Yes. Yeah, so um, of course there is actually different, so actually we, we're now looking at different bacteria in these processes. So far, I have to say Staphylococcus has seems to be the strongest one. And of course, this also is gonna be, is linked in part with some of this ERV phenomena. So I think Staphylococcus seems to be incredibly good. I mean, the few strain we have used, I mean, we still have a billion one to test. <laughs> But the few strains we have is at least the one that are non-pathogenic or at least not, you know, don't have actually those, some of those aggressive toxin tend to actually be remarkably good at doing that. So I think, you know, I don't really think ever that we're going to be able to utilize the bacteria as a therapy, but learning that 17 does that is something we gained from the bacteria and now we can actually revisit that as a potential therapy. Thank you. Please join me in well, <laughs> thanking Dr. Belkade once again. So the final tiny order of business um, uh, be before we close out the session, uh, I'd like you to please welcome uh, Dr. Yvette McCarter, uh, who's the co-chair uh, of the meeting this year and who will be staying on uh, next year uh, as the co-chair. Thank you so much, Coomer, and good evening, everyone. Um, first, actually, I do have to say, is it too late to identify myself as a trainee? Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> Me. I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I'd like to echo Dr. Finkel's sentiments this, this afternoon about uh, the importance of coming together again. And on behalf of the ASM Micro Program Committee, I'm excited to welcome all of you back to in-person meetings. So as co-chairs of the program committee, both Coomer and I have the distinct pleasure to work with a group of talented and dedicated colleagues. And I can tell you that they have worked tirelessly this year to create an amazing lineup of sessions for Microbe 2022. So I know that I speak for Coomer in, in thanking all of them and showing our sincere appreciation for all of their hard work. So if we could give them a round of applause, that would be great. I'd also like to extend my congratulations to John and all of the awardees and fellows who were recognized today. Um, ASM is pleased to honor these brilliant individuals for their outstanding career achievements. I'd also like to thank uh, Stefano and Yasmin for kicking off the first of what will be many excellent presentations that we have planned over the next four days. I thank you all for attending today's opening session, and I sincerely look forward to seeing all of you throughout the week. Please enjoy Microbe 2022. Thanks, everyone.